Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today's podcast is part of a very special event that's celebrating people who create things on the internet. It's Create ICG Week when a bunch of internet creators are putting out videos, podcasts, blogs, and more, all on the theme of create, with all sorts of different approaches and interpretations. The event is centered around the Internet Creators Guild, a non-profit organization with a mission to support, represent, and connect creators whose primary platform is online. Now, if you'd like to find out more about them, you can go to internetcreatorsguild.com, and to find more amazing creations by ICG members, search hashtag create ICG on your social media of choice. Check out our show notes for links or go to createicg.wordpress.com for lists of creators and their works. Our contribution to this week is a video, appropriately enough, on the word create itself. And in addition to this video, there's also a blog post with additional details that weren't included in the video. And of course, this very podcast you're listening to. So we'll get to that in a moment. We'll be listening to the voiceover from that video, and we've got a whole bunch of extra information we want to talk about. But as usual, we need to start with what we're drinking. <laughs> and tonight is not a cocktail. At my suggestion, we're drinking mead, which is a kind of honey wine, particularly popular in the Middle Ages. In particular, this mead is Lindisfarne mead. <laughs> at least that's what it says. Named after the monastery at Lindisfarne, mm -hmm. which it was an Anglo-Saxon monastery, very important in early literary production. Mm -hmm. And in particular, you can see on the label that they're modeling themselves after the Lindisfarne gospel, I yes. think, yeah. in particular, right? Which is a particular illuminated Very manuscript. gorgeous manuscript, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lindisfarne, also famous as being... The first place sacked by Vikings when the Viking invasions started. Mm -hmm. So... On that note, we will explain why mead is particularly appropriate, perhaps towards the end of the podcast, yes, I yeah. think, so judging by our plan. So you'll be a surprise ending, <laughs> though some of you may have guessed. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's turn now to the voiceover and listen to the etymology of the word create and its connections to the act of creation more broadly. The word create comes from the Latin verb creare, with more or less the same range of meanings. But if we go back further, we come to the Proto-Indo-European root care, which means to grow. So Latin creara actually comes from a suffixed form of the verb with the sense of to cause to grow. We can see that sense of to grow in a different suffixed form, which leads to the related Latin verb crescere. But it's from these two ideas, the base sense of growing and the causative sense of creating, that we can find an interesting insight into the act of creation more generally. Creation isn't always a deliberate act. Sometimes it's a more organic process of growing, and can therefore involve the influence of one's surroundings and build on what has come before. No one creates in a vacuum. Well, except in many creation myths from different cultures around the world, which sometimes describe the creation of the cosmos from chaos, which originally meant gap or void, so creation out of nothingness. One story of creation is the Judeo-Christian biblical narrative, you know, the Let There Be Light story which was creatively retold in musical form in the 1799 oratorio The Creation, composed by Joseph Haydn. The text of Haydn's oratorio draws not only on the biblical account, but also on the epic poem Paradise Lost by John Milton. Milton's poem, which actually focuses mainly on the story of the fall of Adam and Eve and of the rebel angels led by Lucifer, was a very influential work, also in part inspiring the novel Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Frankenstein is the story of the creation of life as well, how the scientist Victor Frankenstein fashions and brings to life a creature, which has since become an icon of gothic horror. Note that word creature. It comes, of course, from create, and thus meant something created by God. Here Frankenstein tries to play God, but the thing he creates turns out to be a monster, giving us the common modern meaning of creature as monster. Think creature feature. In the novel, the creature sees himself as a sort of Adam, but out of spite at being abandoned by his creator, turns to evil and becomes, like the rebel angels in Milton's poem, a sort of devil. Another inspiration for Mary Shelley in writing the novel was the Greek myth of Prometheus. According to one version, Prometheus created the human race on the instructions of the chief god Zeus. 
However, he went against Zeus's wishes in also giving to human beings the secret of fire, the metaphorical light of invention, and for that he was punished with continual torture, just like Lucifer is punished by being cast into hell in Paradise Lost. And Mary Shelley had one last source of inspiration for her story about the creation of life, some experiments that Erasmus Darwin, grandfather of evolutionary scientist Charles, made when investigating the theory of the spontaneous generation of life, though the exact nature of the experiments are a little unclear, as she recalled it involving Darwin causing spontaneous movement in a piece of, believe it or not, vermicelli. So a sort of spaghetti monster. And that's a little taste of how the lines of creative inspiration can work. But turning from the taste of pasta to the taste of breakfast, that Latin verb crescere also gives us the word crescent from the idea of the waxing or growing moon, and from there the word croissant, that crescent-shaped breakfast pastry. But even more breakfasty is another word we get from that same growing root, cereal, from the Roman goddess of agriculture Ceres. Cereal basically means grain, but of course the eating of cooked grains as a breakfast food, think porridge or oatmeal, goes back hundreds if not thousands of years. One of the first cold breakfast cereals as we know them today was cornflakes, invented by John Harvey Kellogg in 1894. Kellogg, who ran the Battle Creek Sanitarium, a kind of 19th century health spa, was a bit of an oddball who, in addition to having rather unsavoury views about eugenics and genital mutilation, also believed that a bland vegetarian diet would suppress the urge to masturbate, which he thought was just about the worst thing you could do and would lead to a myriad of health problems, not least of which was blindness. Kellogg was experimenting with a breakfast gruel made from a variety of grains, but accidentally allowed some to go hard. In an attempt to rescue the situation, he passed the muck through rollers and then toasted the resulting flakes, and voila, the cornflake was born, leading eventually to the multi-million dollar breakfast cereal industry. And as we know, what every breakfast cereal needs to catch the eyes of consumers is a mascot. The famous cornflake rooster was suggested to Kellogg by his Welsh friend, harpist Nancy Richards, as a pun on his name, since the Welsh word for rooster is Kellogg. Richards was a student of harpist John Thomas, who himself was admitted at age 14 into the Royal Academy of Music in London through the influence of Ada Lovelace, the daughter of poet Lord Byron, today celebrated as the creator of computer programming for her work with Charles Babbage on the first mechanical computer ever designed, the analytical engine. Lovelace was introduced to Babbage by her tutor, Mary Somerville, who was also a highly celebrated scientist. In fact, arguably the very first scientist, as the word itself was first coined by William Hewell in his glowing review of Somerville's book On the Connection of the Physical Sciences, which was one of the best-selling science books of the 19th century. Somerville was also one of the first two female members of the Royal Astronomical Society, being jointly inducted along with Carolyn Herschel, sister of famed astronomer William Herschel, the discoverer of the planet Uranus. William Herschel was often pestered by visitors, including composer Joseph Haydn, who, it turns out, was a bit of an astronomy fanboy, and included a section in his oratorio The Creation on the creation of the planets. But getting back to breakfast, the etymology of the word itself will prove instructive for our story of creation. You see, breakfast, which is first recorded in the 15th century, literally means to break one's fast, fast here in the sense of not eating overnight. The funny thing is, so does the earlier 13th century word dinner. The word dinner comes through French from the Latin elements dis, basically a negative prefix, and yeunus, meaning fasting or hungry. So literally dinner means to break one's fast, or breakfast, the first meal of the day. And indeed in the Middle Ages, dinner really was the first big meal of the day, and was eaten around noon. So dinner meant breakfast, but was eaten at lunch and now often refers to the last meal of the day. Confused yet? These shifting mealtimes have a number of causes, including the working day, which originally followed the daylight hours, assuming you were a farmer working the fields, for instance. But with the shift to indoor factory work during the Industrial Revolution, often with artificial lighting, the major meal, dinner, would have a tendency to move later in the day after working hours, with a light lunch, meaning originally lump, so a small bit of handheld food one could eat quickly, in the middle of the day. Another factor influencing the mealtimes of the non-working class was the various social obligations of the 18th and 19th centuries. The afternoon was taken up with social calls one was expected to pay and repay, so again dinner had the tendency to slip later and later in the day to accommodate this. But perhaps the most interesting social activity of the leisured class that had an impact on mealtimes was the ever-creative world of the theatre. 
You see, in Shakespeare's day, theatres were open air, like the famous Globe Theatre, and relied on the natural lighting of the sun. But later, as the theatre moved indoors with artificial lighting, theatre hours were no longer fixed. We can see this also reflected in the word matinee, which we now think of as an afternoon performance. Etymologically speaking, matinee, from French matin meaning morning, originally referred to a morning musical performance, from the French phrase matinee musicale. So for instance you might go to see a performance of Haydn's creation in the morning as a matinee, but as the main performance slipped later and later, so too did the matinee, giving us the afternoon performance we think of now, once again all thanks to artificial lighting. The history of artificial lighting of course goes back a long way, with such technologies as oil lamps, burning fuels like olive oil in ancient Greece and Rome, and candles made from animal fats in the medieval period, but there were no real advances in artificial lighting for thousands of years. In the theatres of the 17th century stages were lit with large chandeliers which had the disadvantage of dripping hot grease on theatre goers and actors alike. The first creative breakthrough came with the advent of footlights, putting the candles at the front of the stage with reflectors in front of them to cast the light back on the actors and shield the direct light from the audience. To this day the word footlights still means the theatre, even though they are no longer used. The famed 18th century actor and theatre manager David Garrick is sometimes claimed to have imported the new lighting techniques into England from France, and though they may predate him, Garrick was certainly responsible for dispensing with the chandeliers at his Theatre Royal Drury Lane and adopting new stage lighting techniques, including lighting from the wings. The next technological breakthrough came with the invention of a new type of oil lamp called the Argand lamp, patented by its inventor Aimé Argand in 1780, which featured a hollow circular wick and glass chimney, allowing for a much brighter light with less smoke, though requiring a considerable amount of oil, and these were quickly adopted by theatres such as Drury Lane, though after Garrick's time. Another big innovation was gas lighting, pioneered by William Murdoch in 1792, who produced combustible gas by heating up coal and designed a lamp to burn it in. The process of producing the coal gas was actually originally discovered by accident by one Archibald Cochrane who was trying to produce tar to preserve the wooden hulls of ships, and in passing mentioned the flammable gas to James Watt, inventor of the steam engine. As for Murdoch, he claimed the idea as his own and brought it to Matthew Bolton, Industrial Revolution bigwig and partner of James Watt, big coincidence, at whose firm Murdoch worked, and soon Murdoch's coal gas lamp was lighting the Bolton and Watt Soho factory. Bolton, by the way, was a good friend of Erasmus Darwin, remember him? In any case, these new gas lights were a boon to the Industrial Revolution, allowing for better factory lighting and also had knock-on social effects such as night classes and popular science lectures, which further bolstered the creativity and innovation, and evening social functions, like the theatre and musical concerts. Drury Lane and other theatres were quick to adopt the new gas lights by the early 19th century. It was around this time, by the way, that Haydn's creation was first performed in London, and, coincidentally enough, Thomas Linley, who was in charge of the oratorios at Drury Lane, may have had a hand in writing the first English text of Haydn's great work. Small world. But getting back to artificial lighting innovations, next up was limelight, produced by using an oxyhydrogen flame to superheat quicklime, in other words calcium oxide, which then incandesces, producing a tremendously bright light. The effect was originally discovered in the 1820s by a surgeon and chemist by the name of Goldsworthy Gurney, but was put into practice in a viable lamp by Scottish civil engineer Thomas Drummond, who, after hearing about the effect in a public lecture by famed scientist Michael Faraday, invented his lamp, initially to aid in the surveying work he did as a civil engineer. But it wasn't long before the lighting technology was adopted in the theatre world, by around the middle of the 19th century, especially for spotlights and to this day we still have the expression in the limelight, though nowadays of course spotlights are all electric. The first kind of viable electric light invented was the carbon arc light, which essentially works by causing an electric current to jump between two pieces of carbon which very slowly combust, producing a brilliant light. As it turns out, the arc light was invented in 1809 by Humphrey Davy, sometime employer of Michael Faraday. But of course the type of electric light we most likely think of today is the light bulb, invented by Thomas Edison. I say invented, but it was really perfected by him in 1879, as there were numerous other creators of versions of the light bulb before Edison. But through trial and error, with various materials for the filament, Edison and his team made the technology viable. And again, this is very appropriate for understanding how the creative process works, often through accidental discovery and never working in a vacuum. 
unless you're putting a filament in a vacuum to make a light bulb. And this is appropriate too, given that the light bulb has become the standard iconic representation of creative inspiration. What's more, this story has come just about full circle, as Edison happened to be a patient of John Harvey Kellogg, though there's no word on whether or not he ate the cornflakes. Let there be light. So of course in that voiceover uh, I of course refer to different terms for meals, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and the way they changed. And the way they there's this time shift going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted to point out, I was focusing there mainly on the English terms of course, mm -hmm. but I wanted to bring up an interesting parallel in the French of course, which comes from the same root which, as dinner. Which word? So the word déjeuner okay. comes from the same right. déjeunare. De, déjeunare, yeah. It had the original sense, therefore, mm -hmm. of breakfast. Right, to break fast. To mm -hmm. break fast. But of course, it too shifts later mm -hmm. from breakfast to lunch. So now a modern French déjeuner refers to lunch. lunch. Right. And I like the way that they filled in the gap for breakfast, therefore, mm -hmm. by calling breakfast petit déjeuner. Right. Little, little, little breakfast, little lunch. Little <laughs> lunch, yeah, little <laughs> breakfast, yeah. Which, of course, kind of echoes the um, difference between traditionally the continental breakfast and the English breakfast. Right. Because the English breakfast traditionally, even once the lunch meal became and dinner became the bigger meals, mm -hmm. was quite hearty. At yes. least a conventional English breakfast is pretty hearty. Whereas a conventional French breakfast, mm -hmm. the continental one, with their crescents, yes. the croissant, croissant. Mm -hmm. is quite light. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of pastry and yeah. some coffee. Yeah. And actually, th this is a, a kind of a point in when I was animating the video, mm -hmm. uh, and I was looking for various pictures to illustrate the idea of breakfast, and I eventually just settled on the bowl of cereal mm -hmm. and croissant, since right. they were already there. They're already being, already being about, mentioned. So they, yeah. they, they were good enough to stand in for breakfast mm -hmm. itself. But for a while, I was considering showing you know, a plate of bacon and eggs and right. you know the, the, the full english the full english yeah. the beans and everything <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of croissants of course there are interesting stories none of these i would necessarily believe but uh, venture to call fact legends yeah. <laughs> let's say about the creation of the croissant i mean basically right. we don't really know right but there are numerous stories about uh where it came from and why this particular shape why the crescent shape mm -hmm. so one the earliest story uh, the earliest in terms of the chronology of the legend right is that it uh commemorates the defeat of the umayyad by the franks in 732 at the battle of tours the Umayyad? The Umayyad. Who are the Umayyad? Should it's I know that? The, that's the is that the first caliphate. You can tell neither of us are real historians. Goodness, not real. No. <laughs> and to be fair, if I am supposed to know any history, it's supposed to be another thousand years before that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the Umayyad Caliphate was the second major Arab caliphates established after the death of Muhammad. Okay. And so, therefore, the crescent shape, a symbol that they used on their flags. Um, so they defeated them, so they made their bread shape like them. They, yes, exactly. Okay. As you do. <laughs> As one does. It's like freedom fries, right? No. <laughs> That's not parallel at all. <laughs> okay, maybe not. <laughs> The second story, or the second two... It would be like if you cut potatoes into fleur-de-lis, and, <laughs> yes. and then you go, I eat all your potatoes as fleur-de-lis to prove that the, you didn't like the French. It doesn't make any sense at all. Sorry. <laughs> Please go on. The second sort of pair of, of possibilities is that it commemorates the defeat of the Turks, the Ottomans, mm -hmm. um, in the siege of either Vienna in 1683 or Budapest, or really at that time, I think it was just Buda. I don't know if it was. It's the two cities. <laughs> Please don't that joined look up. at me. Please don't look at me as if I'm so going to know. Buda, Buda and Pest were two cities. <laughs> I do know that. I just don't know the date one. when they yes. became one. Uh, I don't know the. Look, I'm working my way through history <laughs> podcasts, but I'm not there yet. Okay. <laughs> there's a whole hunk. There's a history. There's a. Oh, that's a Bulgarian history podcast. I haven't got to yet. And yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that was in 1686. So approximately the same time. This right. is the, same, you know, when the Ottoman Turks were kind of invading those areas. Mm -hmm. So in either case, commemorating... Uh, a defeat of Islam by Christendom. Yeah. So I don't know if any of these stories are true, but right. it's kind of interesting anyways. Mm -hmm. And of course, it also therefore somewhat establishes for some city a claim as being the inventor of the croissant. So I suppose uh, hence, there's a certain amount of, you know, national pride involved in all of this. Right. This would be why these stories are being told, yes. 
So staying on the topic of breakfast, <laughs> breakfast, <laughs> breakfast foods, foods. <laughs> of course, I talk a lot about the invention of the cornflake, our friend John Harvey Kellogg. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to claim him as a friend. <laughs> as friend no, Please, he is not a friend man. of the podcast. Yes, he's quite an awful man, yeah. really. It's quite ironic, of course, that he was so into these bland, particularly vegetarian diet mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. particular. The irony is that, you know, of course, we talked about the, the mascot coming out of a pun on his name, mm -hmm. but his actual name, Kellogg, has an interesting etymology itself. Yeah. It comes from literally kill hog. It's an occupational name for a butcher. Ah. <laughs> Right. So uh, he comes from a, a background, family background of butchers. <laughs> and he renounced, he renounced it and moved it into, and vegetarianism. into vegetarianism. Yes. And, and unfortunately, a bunch of other horrible things. Yeah. Mm, turned his killing ways on other people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Etymology is not destiny, people. No. Etymology is, that is not that destiny. Is absolute proof of the, against the, what is it Onomastic called? Nom nom nominative. Nominative determinism. determinism. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Or the onomastic fallacy. Onomastic fallacy. Sure. I'd made, I may have made that up. That might be it. It sounds good, though. Yeah. And so, again, staying on the etymology mm -hmm. uh, Just topic, to fill in all these little these gaps, little, yeah. Little etymological details. I wanted... I mentioned the etymology of the word matinee, coming mm -hmm. from French matin. word for morning, yeah. matin. And I wanted to sort of go a little bit further back. So, matin comes from Latin matutinus. Mm -hmm. Is that a word you'd ever heard before? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a common, it's not no. an everyday word, but I did know it. Well, it goes even further back to a Proto-Indo-European root, ma, mm -hmm. which means good. Oh, okay. That so I didn't know. the way the sense shift works there is it's good in, in terms of timely, a good time. Oh, okay. A good okay. time for yeah. something. And it also gives us words like mature, mm -hmm. for instance. Is mane as in morning? Related to that? Could well be. I don't know. Because that's the standard, the standard word, word for, for morning. morning. Yeah. It, specifically, it's the Latin for in the morning. In the morning. Mane, right. mane. is a fixed form, and it looks ablative, mm -hmm. but I don't actually know if that's exactly what it is. But it's a temporal adverb, essentially. Right. Yeah, it, it must be. The other way you may know that word is from the Roman goddess Mater, Mater Matuta. Right. Right. The, the goddess of the morning who is the, becomes the Roman equivalent of Aurora. Right. And from that, there is one of these obscure words in English mm -hmm. um, that you will find in few dictionaries. <laughs> uh, you'll find it basically in lists of obscure words. Right. Matuto lipea. So lipea means grief or sorrow. Okay. And so matuto lipea, this is a horrible mixing of Greek and Latin, I guess. Mm -hmm. But matuto lipea, therefore, means, well, it's usually glossed as grumpiness in the morning. Right, Bad so sorrow morning. at having to wake up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's a, that's a totally made-up word that nobody has ever used, <laughs> yeah, except yes. in a self-conscious way, I'm it sure. It seems to me, yeah. yeah. But it's a nice word, and I think one... Well, one should, one could apply to every word. morning. <laughs> it's a very useful word. I'm, I'm, I often feel grumpy in the morning, so... I think but I should can you pronounce that in the morning? Ah, well, there you go. <laughs> but it reminds me of an Anglo-Saxon word, urkara. Uh-huh. Which means grief before dawn is how it's usually glossed. Mm -hmm. So again, it's this idea of sorrow in the morning. Now, is that grumpiness though? Or Not is grumpiness. It... No, this. So this. It's usually used in the context. It's used in the elegies. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the wanderer. It's used in the context of the, the sort of sorrow that you feel at your lot in life, that your your hardships that you existential feel at worst, angst. Ex existential angst yeah. that you feel worst in the, those hours just before dawn. Mm -hmm. It's always darkest before the dawn. Yes. That, that kind of sense that, kind that of there's idea. a there's a yeah. sorrow that's a low point in one's mm -hmm. mood. So, so it's I don't proper know. grieving yeah. in the morning, not just yeah, grumpiness exactly. in the morning. Yeah. I'm not sure a bowl of cornflakes will <laughs> do much <laughs> too to, much to uh, help your grumpiness or your grief. <laughs> to be honest, I think the thing that the cornflakes was supposed to prevent would probably do a better, better job, job of making <laughs> you feel better in the morning. <laughs> Not to earn us an explicit tag or anything on this one. <laughs> we did say that we wanted to start this off as as a euphemism, you know, to eat the cornflakes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I think he's been eating his cornflakes. I don't think he's been eating his cornflakes, though. <laughs> yeah. See if you can spread that, okay? <laughs> uh, maybe a nice croissant would be a better cure for I don't think the French grief. breakfast is meant to discourage any such. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
don't want anything that's you know too heavy, too heavy or, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just engaging in a little cultural stereotyping there, sorry. <laughs> and one last extra etymological tidbit that I wanted to add that I think will kind of kick us off on our further deeper discussions about mm -hmm. creativity itself. This is a disputed etymology. No one really knows where the word sincere comes from. But okay. one of the possibilities, and the one I think to my mind is most likely, is that it comes from that care root, the mm -hmm. growing root mm -hmm. that we get to create from. The first part comes from sem, meaning same. In fact, okay. it gives us the word same. So literally, one growth, sem, care, sincere. One, oh, okay. One growth, therefore sort of pure. And so sincere originally had, right. earlier had the okay. sense of kind of unmixed with yeah. other types of emotion. Right, right, right. pure. Yeah. Pure. And indeed, even before it had that later sort of figurative sense, in the 16th century, it meant literally in pure unmixed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay in a sort of technical sense right so that sort of to my mind makes sense and i think it's actually quite appropriate for our discussion of creation mm -hmm. because of the well-known phrase imitation is the sincerest form of flattery right that's the purest form of flattery and the purest form of flattery that does lead us into what what one of the things i wanted to talk about because the other thing about that metaphor of purity mm -hmm is often part of the discourse of creativity. So when we talk about creativity, one of the things we often mean now is originality as well. Like creativity, and they're not the same thing, but they're linked. Right. One wants to be original. And of course, original means, etymologically speaking, which isn't the same as what it means now, but that it comes from the beginning of things. Mm -hmm. It arises from the beginning. And so you do get this idea of, if your creativity is imitation or is built on somebody else, then it's not pure creativity. It's, it's lacking in some way, or it's muddied, or it's not as good, or it's not even creativity. Right. It's just imitation, or it's just altering somebody else's idea and building on somebody else's idea. And part of what you talked about in the video is that creation, in fact, is very never. frequently if perhaps always, perhaps always, yeah. um, at least in the realm of invention and even in the realm of literary, literary creation, comes from somewhere. Yeah, always comes there's from somewhere. A tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, or there's just also there's inspiration. Yes, and those true. inspiration is necessary mm -hmm. to creativity. You mm -hmm. can't have creativity from a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Um, without input, you don't have output. Yeah. And I know that's, in fact, some of, one of the things that a lot of creators struggle with because as you spend more and more time creating you spend less and less time consuming. Right. And then I, I know that that can be something that I've heard authors talk about, you know, or musicians or video creators that at first they create because they're inspired by other people's work mm -hmm. and by all the ideas that they get from other things. Then they start spending all their time creating. Mm -hmm. They don't have time to watch stuff anymore or listen to stuff or read stuff. Mm -hmm. And their well can run dry, that they can yeah. have trouble finding new ideas because, in fact, ideas don't come from inside you. They come from what is inside you interacting with what's outside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the same way that you have to experience emotions in order to have something, not the same emotions you write about in a novel, but you have to have experienced some emotions in order to be able to kind of write about others, you know, that kind of idea. And the reason I wanted to... Well, partly I think that that ties in with what you were talking about. But also, we've talked about this before on this podcast, but the idea of creativity and originality has shifted a lot over mm -hmm. the centuries and the, the millennia. And when we look back to the ancient world, they too had a metaphor of purity when they talked about creation. And specifically, um, some poets anyway had the idea it, it was associated usually with water pure right. water, right? So the spring, I've used the metaphor several times already, right. the wellspring of creativity or the pure springs of Mount Parnassus, the, where the springs of the muses are and you go right. up and you drink from the water, the pure water. And there's a whole school of poetry in, in the Hellenistic period in Rome that is all about how uh, they want to be the, the small, clear springs and not the muddy rivers right. the common people drink from, <laughs> right? But there it's, um, some of that's about elitism. Yeah. And the idea of originality is not, the modern idea of originality isn't really part of what's 
being talked about there. I don't think very many ancient, now I'm thinking about creation from a literary point of view, because that is the place where most classical authors think of there being creation, creativity. And in poetry and in music, I don't think most of those authors would understand the idea of coming up with a new thought completely on your own as being a good idea. Mm -hmm. And we actually just talked about this with Baba a little bit, right. about how Horace was talking about how, you know, everybody likes the old poets better than the new poets. Right. Right? They don't like the new poetry because it's not old and classic. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there he's very specifically saying people don't like originality, or at least something new. Mm -hmm. And he's arguing that, in fact, people have always liked, you know, new things are good. The Greeks did new things. The Romans did new things. That's where the mm -hmm. classics come from. They come from mm -hmm. new things. And just because they're old, mm -hmm. suddenly they're respectable. Uh, I'm not suggesting that n ancient poets never had new ideas. Of course they did. But they very consciously and explicitly always built on previous work. Mm -hmm. And for many poets, even for Horace, when he's claiming originality in, in the poem that he was talking about this in, he's claiming originality in the new way he is manipulating traditional material. Right. How he's taken old genres and changed them. How he's translated Greek ideas into Latin for the first time. So he's original because he's new, the first to do it in Latin. Mm -hmm. But he's taking something that somebody else has already written. And in fact, the guarantee of the quality of what he's doing is that it does model itself on Alcaeus and Sappho and other Greek uh, lyric poets, for instance. That if he was writing lyric poet uh, poetry that didn't have some kind of forerunner that wasn't in a conversation of interaction with these previous poets, even he wouldn't think it was good. Right. So originality lies in a new approach and a change to an old form. And there's a myriad of ways that can happen. Lots of different ways that can happen. We see that in Virgil, and we talked about this when we talked about it in The Force Awakens, right. where he is original because of how he is manipulating and using the Homeric corpus. Not because he thought up an idea about a guy traveling around totally out of his own brain. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's using mythical material. Originality, therefore, is not really a sought after or even really fully conceptualized in the way that we sometimes talk about it now as something that's just wholly new and comes fully fledged, like that light bulb, right. you know, that light bulb light moment bulb of moment. complete yeah. inspiration. That really just doesn't, I mean, obviously that metaphor wouldn't make any sense to the ancient <laughs> world, <laughs> but, but even the idea of it. Now, they do have the sense of inspiration, of course. Right. And what they have is the sense, literally, of inspiration. Right. The Latin word is to breathe in. Mm -hmm. And so you can be inspired by a god because a god literally comes into your spirit or mm -hmm. your breath. And Horace, again, claims a couple of his poems inspiration from the god Bacchus, who is right. one Dionysus, who is one of the gods associated with creativity. And he says he's, he wanders the woods and Bacchus drives him mad as a poet is driven mad. It fills him with a sort of creative craziness <laughs> it's, it's his essential term for it. Remember, Dionysus is the god of poetry and of wine. Right. Those are related. And of madness. Uh, he makes people ecstatic. They stand outside themselves. So all of that is a type of creativity. Yes. But it's a creativity that comes to you from outside. And then the other kind of creativity, the other kind of inspiration that all the classical poets talk about is, of course, the inspiration of the muses. muses yeah. But who are the muses? The muses are the daughters of memory, the daughters of mnemosyne. So the muses, when they inspire you, are not inspiring you with new, unthought of originality. They are inspiring you to remember. They are remembering for you, right. and they're giving you something to remember. I mean, there's a couple of senses of the way that they're connected to memory. But again, it's a, it's a connection to a tradition, right. and that's most obvious with epic, but even with other poets like Elegy and things. It's never, even Roman Love Elegy, which is one of the few genres that they kind of claimed as their own, by no means just sprung fully formed from Zeus's head. I mean, mm -hmm. it develops very clearly out of a bunch of, of previous work, and none of the poets ever claim to you know have made it up themselves. Speaking of the muses, Milton does an interesting thing with this mm -hmm. he refers to the heavenly muse by which he means mm -hmm. the holy spirit right so again the idea inspiration, of inspiration yeah. again mm -hmm. and of course milton is absolutely basing his his epic paradise mm -hmm. lost on 
Homer and Virgil. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course, yes. So anyway, I just wanted to say that because I think, you know, part of this has to do with lack of copyright, lack of the idea of intellectual property and all of these other things. But it is, I think, instructive to think about what we mean by creativity and to focus on the fact that creativity and originality are not the same thing. Because right. I think they're too often used as if they're synonyms mm -hmm. and that nothing is creative unless it's original. And I don't think that's... I just don't think that's true. And I don't think that's, in fact, what many of us really think if we sat down and thought about what we think is the most creative in the world. Mm -hmm. The things we might name or the things we might point to are not necessarily original. But no. there's a kind of simplistic equation of the two. Yeah. So, it, again, I, I think we're doing a, a surprisingly good job of segueing this time. <laughs> <laughs> because talking about ancient conceptions of creativity and originality mm -hmm. and divine inspiration... I think brings us to the other aspect that you touch on in the video, but you don't really get into, which is creation. Creation, creation myths. Yeah, and creation the, the stories, stories of creation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you know we both know about, but also I'm currently teaching a class on interpretation of myth, and we spent quite a long time talking about creation stories, and then the Crash Course Mythology series has, has just, just started, started up. Yeah, and they've had their episode on... Their first episode myth. on creation myths. There's going to be several, I think. Mm -hmm. And maybe more by the time this comes out. So I've just watched that. So yeah, we've been thinking about creation myths. And then you also recently got... I recently got the book by Neil Gaiman on Norse myth. Mm -hmm. And so I've been revisiting all these Norse myths that I you know, studied in grad school. So I've been kind of rereading them now. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's quite an excellent retelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been, I haven't I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I we got it because everybody's been gushing about it. Well, and because I knew it would be good, but right. But in particular, therefore, there's the stories of the Norse creation the myths. The Norse creation myths. Yeah. But before we get to that, maybe we don't need to rehearse a whole bunch of creation myths. Right. There's lots of places you can go and find out about creation myths. But I know one of the aspects of creation myths you wanted to talk about a bit was uh, more a little more on the word chaos. Yes. And this is an etymology that I touched on in more detail in the video for linoleum. Yes, when you talked about gas. When I talked about gas, gasoline, mm -hmm. and where the word gas comes from. Gas comes from the same source as chaos. Um, in fact, it comes from the word chaos. It's a, it's in a that slightly twisty, turning twisty way. Twisty, turning yeah. way. So the modern sense that we have of the word chaos, this idea of disorder, mm -hmm. is actually quite a late development. It doesn't really crop up until the 17th century. Mm -hmm. So earlier on, chaos meant what it did in the Greek word, uh, which is void or gap. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's so that's the original sense of the word. It comes from a proto Indo European root geu, which means to gape or yawn. Mm -hmm. And it also gives us the Norse word ginungagap, right? Which is involved in the Norse story of creation. This is the void out of which the first the, everything is grows, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything in the beginning, it, it, it's not given in this form, but it's in the beginning there was. And I cannot say that word, it doesn't matter how many times I read it, I cannot say it. it's got too many G's. Ginninga gap. That. I just can't. I, I, I'm, I have a block on the word. Chaos is a lot easier. Chaos is a lot easier. The, the way, by the way, that uh, just to, to sort of briefly summarize the way that the word gas comes from chaos is that the chemist who originally was describing this form of matter, mm -hmm. gas, mm -hmm. was referring to it, uh, the Greek chaos before creation. Right. This sort of formless... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the educational background, and then we go back to yeah. what we talked about with education, of these early experimenters. I mean, we talked about that. They, these were these people who were educated in a classical manner mm -hmm. to just not to be scientists. They were educated in a very sort of literary-based way, and then they were men of means or men of leisure who yeah. had the time to experiment, and they took the first steps down the experimental paths towards chemistry and biology and all of these things. And, you know, it's not surprising that so much is influenced, not just that they use Latinate terms for stuff, but that their yeah. conception of the world really was f based on classical learning. That scientist, by the way, was Jan Baptiste van Helmont, a Flemish scientist. Okay. If that comes up in a trivia game, you know, that you're playing. Yeah, so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was why it ends up with a G, right? 
Yes, because it's the Flemish pronunciation of chaos. Of the Greek, yeah. Something close to gas. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I mean, that was one of the things that the Crash Course video that I just watched was talking about it. You know, we can divide our creation myths very, very roughly into those that start with some kind of nothingness or Mm -hmm. void or at least very little, like just water or something like chaos or just the sky Mm -hmm. known as ex nihilo from nothing creation and then the many i think more myths they may not be the best known because genesis of course is an ex nihilo mostly and therefore is one of the ones that kind of overwhelms our ideas about and between that and the greek one we tend to think oh well everything Everything starts that way but in fact i think the majority of creation myths don't they start with something Mm -hmm. They start with a god, or they start with a place, or they start with an animal, or they start with a body, or they start with something. There's already stuff. Though it should be pointed out that there are ex nihilo uh, creation myths from around the world. They're oh, not, no, absolutely. They're not related. No, no. It's, uh, so. Yeah, I didn't mean to imply that they, were, that they all... In fact, I don't know that the Greek one... Well, I guess the Greek one and the Genesis one were probably both cre- relative to the Mesopotamian myth. Yeah. That's probably their link. Yeah. Because the Mesopotamian myth also starts with water. Yeah. But no, there are other ones from other unrelated places as well. But I think there are just more by number. They may be less influential, but there are more by number that are not. Mm -hmm. Because, in fact, thinking of nothingness is quite difficult. Right. It's also interesting. We tend to think of creation myths as also creating people, Mm -hmm. being stories about both the world and people Mm -hmm. kind of tied together. But you mentioned Prometheus. One of the interesting things about the Greek myths of creation is that they do a really bad job of explaining where people come from. That is, it's not like there's this cosmological, and when we say the Greek creation myths, we really mean Hesiod. Right. Because he's the one who, he's the only one really, until quite a lot later, who gives us any kind of explicit creation myth. And in his story, you have the cosmological stuff about the sky and the earth and all of that, and then you have development of it. Uh, basic elemental forces and then you have the development of the gods and only way late in the game do you have people being created and he has, gives you several different stories of how the people how humans mm-hmm. are created that don't mesh but then that's normal in myth yeah and there is essentially no motivation given for it you say in the video that prometheus does it at the bidding of zeus and then it's a story but it's a later story he said just basically says prometheus makes men Right. He doesn't say why Prometheus wants to do it. He doesn't say if anyone tells him to. And in one of the other versions, he doesn't even give that. Um, right. And in others, they grow from trees or they just appear and there's the f- races of men, um, different, you know, golden, silver, bronze, heroic, and iron ages of men. And they're all different. People are created, then wiped out again and again mm-hmm. until we end up with the, the iron age we're in now. And so it's it's kind of funny because on the one hand, the Greeks are very humanist they're very concerned about humans like Mm -hmm. humans are really important within the world conception but in the other hand their myths don't really center around the creation of humans they're almost an afterthought right and it's a bit of a it's one of the paradoxes of of greek myth in particular so so getting back to norse myth then Mm -hmm. and the neil gaiman book right one of the bits that i specifically reread because it's relevant to our discussion today is the story of the mead of poetry and scholarship. Right. And it's specifically of not only of poetry, poetic creation, but also scholarship, which I think is... That's totally because it's Snorri telling it. <laughs> well, yes, this is true. This is coming... This version of it, anyways, is coming through Snorri, so... And he is a scholar. He is a scholar. He is yeah. somebody who is trying to collect the old myths and write them down, even though he doesn't believe in them, so that they can be remembered for generations to come. Indeed. So it might... Be, that's why he yes. thinks that he's so yes. important. <laughs> <laughs> well, Neil Gaiman bases is basing his retelling on basically on Snorri. Well, I mean, version. there isn't there there's, isn't that much else, is well, there? Of narrative, there's the poetic Edda. Yeah. Uh, so it's not as narratively clear, mm-hmm. but uh, there's there details are other, in there it. are other details mm-hmm. in other poetic forms. But yes, the the, the most worked out version is Snorri's uh, mm-hmm. prose Edda. So basically, I'm going to summarize the story uh, for for those of you who perhaps are not so familiar with it. Mm -hmm. It all starts off with a war between sort of two groups of gods, the Aesir, who are the sort of main gods that Mm -hmm. we all know, Odin and Thor and and so forth, Mm -hmm. and the Vanir, 
mm-hmm. who are basically gods of fertility. Right. And they decide, you know, this war is not going anywhere and they should make a peace. And so they have a settlement in which they all kind of make a bond, a, a sort of bond of peace mm-hmm. by all spitting into mm-hmm. a big vat. And that, that presumably comes from sort of um, magical ideas about bodily fluids yes. and, and th- that they stand in for you and yeah. things. Because one of the things about the non-cleaned up versions of myth, mm-hmm. when you look around the world, not in, say, Genesis and not in the, the, the literary versions of Greek and Roman myths, which is all we really have of theirs. Right. If you look at other cultures... You see a lot more bodily fluids <laughs> of all sorts. Indeed. And you can see traces of them. Like when Prometheus or God makes man from mud and right. breathes the spirit in, I could totally imagine there was a version before that where he mixed dirt with spit. Right. Right? The mm-hmm. God's the divine essence mm-hmm. or with semen. But but I think spit is probably mm-hmm. even more likely, yeah. actually. So mm-hmm. I think those, those sort of magical elements are... Yeah. Under the surface in some myths, and then others, like the Norse, mm-hmm. they're a little closer to the surface. Yes. Well, bodily fluids are going to play a very yes. big role in this story, because <laughs> yes. it's going to come up again and again. They're going to come up, as it were? <laughs> Well, that's the one bodily fluid that isn't in this story, surprisingly. No. At least not directly. Well, sort of. Sort anyway, of. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so they decide, uh, after making their piece, rather than let letting this vat of spit go to waste, that they do something <laughs> useful with it. So they create a being, Kvasir. Mm-hmm. As and, you do. As you do. And he ends up being this wonderful, creative, knowledgeable person who knows everything. He knows the answer to any question. Right. Because he has the essence of all the gods. Yes. Him. And so he wanders. He, he sort of stays with the gods for a little while. And then he goes and wanders amongst the humans and everyone mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, answers questions and everyone is eager to talk to him and everything. Right including a pair of evil dwarves named Fjallar and Galar, as dwarf mm-hmm. names are, <laughs> always rhyming. They always have to rhyme, yeah. yes. Yeah. And they, for seemingly no particularly good reason, <laughs> decide to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> so after having killed him, they drain the body of blood. Mm-hmm. They mix this blood, so another bodily fluid, mm-hmm. for you. Yeah. They mix this blood with honey mm-hmm. and make mead. Right. So we can pause here to say that is why we're drinking mead, mead. though ours has no blood. No. I hope. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite tasty, though. We didn't actually talk about it at That's the true. beginning. It is good. Yeah, it's it's mild. Yeah, it, and it's a it's a fourteen point five percent volume, like it's a wine. Mm-hmm. It's certainly sweet. It's a dessert wine, but it's not that really thick sweet. Yeah. Mead that you sometimes get. No, oh, it's quite nice. Just pouring out a little bit more, so we have inspiration mm-hmm. to finish. So. They have this mead, which has, has the blood of the, the really blood knowledgeable of, guy, which uh, gives the drinker incredible inspiration. Right. So they, they can spout off the most beautiful, incredible poetry. Or and, scholarship. and scholarship. And scholarship. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> and I would specifically also, like Snorri, like to stress that scholarship bit because, you know, <laughs> I, I think my scholarly uh, output is also creative. Yeah. And yeah, we, won't get, it, we won't get into that yeah. long discussion. But in fact, that is one of the things, the division that the world, the modern world makes between fiction and nonfiction yes. and that only fiction is creative does lie in part in this idea that or only originality is creative. Mm-hmm. So nonfiction or research can't be creative because you're just gathering information somebody else has had. Mm-hmm. And that's only true if you have to be original. I mean, we talk about original scholarship, but when we talk about original scholarship, we still obviously mean yeah. gathering, gathering other information, information yeah. and then mm-hmm. and then synthesizing it or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's one of the things that I... I, I think that that's a false dichotomy that we make. Yeah. So getting back to our story, mm-hmm. our friends Fjallar and Galar continue their unmotivated killing spree <laughs> and kill a giant named Gilling and his wife. Though giants, of course, are generally evil in Norse yeah, myth. Yeah, but, but... neither the, these dwarves are not particularly good either. So, True. you know. Yeah. And eventually their son... Sutung wants, you know, revenge, revenge basically. Because he's Norse. Because he's Norse. And so he, he, uh, he comes to uh, the dwarves, rows them out into the middle of a lake, and then leaves them on a rock, basically. Um, <laughs> and when the tide comes in, I guess it's not a lake, it would be the, the, the ocean, I suppose. When the tide comes mm-hmm. in, they'll drown. Mm-hmm. And so he, by threatening them with this, he ransoms off the mead. 
he gets the meat he gets from the them meat, as, yes, as a ransom. As a ransom to save their lives. So that's how the meat falls into his hands. Okay. So he puts it in his stronghold, basically, guarded by his daughter, who's named Gunlod. So these are still giants. Yes. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the gods want to get this stuff back. Right. Because it's, you know, produced in their spit, and so it, they it's feel... Divine it's divine. It's divine, and they feel it belongs to them. So Odin takes on the case. He disguises himself and takes on the name Bulwark, which means sort of wicked work or bad work or something like that. Okay. And he, first of all, tricks the brother of Sutung, who's named Baugi. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> first of all, he gets Baugi's nine agricultural workers to oh, yeah, uh, fight over this whetstone to sharpen their scythes. They all want to have, because it makes their scythes work better, and so mm -hmm. it makes their job easier. And so he gets them to sort of fight over it, and in doing so, they kill each other with their scythes. Yeah, like the myth of the dragon's teeth men right. in Jason and the Argonauts, or in the uh, story of Thebes, where if you've got a bunch of warlike people to deal with, make them think that right. they have something to fight over, and then let them kill themselves so you mm -hmm. don't have to do it. Because Odin, of course, is clever. Unlike right. Thor, who would have just gone in bashing everybody. Odin is smart. Odin is smart, yeah. So then he, Even before he gets the meat. Even before he gets the meat, yes, <laughs> that's right. So then Odin says he'll do the work of these nine workers, and Baugi, of course, initially doesn't believe that he can, but then mm -hmm. he easily does the work, because he's a god. And then he gets Baugi to show him where the meat is being hidden, right. in this uh, mountainous hiding place, and he uses another magical item, mm -hmm. this time a boar, and drills a hole... Oh, <clears throat> that kind of a bore. That kind of a drilling bore, yes. Right. <laughs> and I don't think anybody, well, I suppose people who do carpentry know what bores are. Bores are, are yes. <laughs> <laughs> And he drills a hole in the wall, mm -hmm. changes himself into a snake, and goes in into the hole and thereby tricks his way into the into the stronghold. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's <clears throat> one more obstacle, the daughter, Gunlod. And so he sleeps with her on three nights, basically uh, seducing her and making her believe that he loves her. And each time saying, oh, if I could only tell poetry to praise your loveliness, but I, I'm not able to do so. Even one little sip of this meat of poetry would give mm -hmm. me the ability to praise your loveliness. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally he gets his way into the three vats and he was supposed to take only three sips by the end. Mm -hmm. And of course, in three sips, he drains the three vats that it's being kept mm -hmm. in. Because one of the features of the gods is that they can drink a lot because mm -hmm. that's an important cultural element in the Norse culture is being able to drink a lot in one draw. Yes. And in, in one draft. Yes. And so he immediately then turns himself into an eagle mm -hmm. and flies away mm -hmm. to take the the mead back home in his belly. Mm -hmm. But of course, Sutung sees what's going on and changes himself into an eagle and starts chasing him. And so there's this, you know, high speed chase through the air. <laughs> high speed eagle chase. <laughs> eagle yes. chase. With Sutung slowly catching up to the overburdened, the overburdened <laughs> belly full of mead, <laughs> Odin. And it's, it's a little unclear. In, in the original source, it says something like, he left some behind. He was so pressed. He was so afraid. Mm -hmm. So make... some mead came out of his body in some form. In some form. As he flew. And the implication seems to mean that he wet himself out of fear. <laughs> <laughs> so he pissed some out. <laughs> As he flew. As he flew. The, uh, I was quite entertained by the fact that Neil Gaiman has it coming out of his ass. Well, well, the thing is, a birds bird, only have one they cloaca, only have right? A cloaca, yeah. So you know, and you know, what is bird poop? What, it is what, both. It's it, both. It, you know, bird poop, bird pee. It's the same thing. So either way, <laughs> he either shoots it at his ass. Uh, I think Gaiman has has him, you know, give a really wet fart or something. <laughs> <laughs> However, it comes out. It's <laughs> bird defecation, <laughs> right? <clears throat> uh, you know, this meat is tasting better every, <laughs> every second. second. Yeah. <laughs> And so that less desirable form of the mead is the mead that inspires the, shall we say, less talented poets and, and scholars. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I can see why Gaiman went for that when. Yes. Then. <laughs> <laughs> but when Odin finally does escape and get mm -hmm. back into the home of the gods, he then vomits out the mead. See, that's what I'm saying. Vomit comes vomit. out too. Yeah. Yes, vomit comes out. Yes. He brings it up. 
he brings it up. Into cauldrons. They have cauldrons set out for him because it's myth and they knew. Yeah. Well, before he (laughs) left, he told Thor in particular, make some big wooden vats to store it in. I'll bring it back. Have it ready. Right. And so Thor does so and he has it ready for when he returns. And so we have this transmutation of bodily fluids from spit to blood Mm -hmm. to piss and vomit. Mm Mm-hmm. And then it's going to be drunk again. And then it's going to be drunk again. To, yeah. in, in order to partake in it, you mm-hmm. have to drink it. Yeah. And then don't they say that some of it, but the, the real poets get it from, it spills out of the vats or something? Well, the, the real poetic inspiration is, yeah, from the vomited out vats. So think about that when you feel inspired. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, the point being that there is this idea that even the gods take their wisdom from ingesting something. For, yes. That there's, a, there's something special. Yes. And that is very typical of Norse myth, where the gods are really not omniscient, really no, not omnipotent. No. Um, they Almost everything they have. Yeah. Odin goes to great lengths to get knowledge. Then mm-hmm. they only are young and immortal because they have the apples mm-hmm. of uh, Freya's apples. Iduna. Or Iduna's apples. And, you know, all these other things. They aren't, they have certain inborn qualities for sure, but many of their powers and many of the certain things that we would think of as divinity actually come to them through external things. And they need to get them right. in, a, in a very different way. I mean, even the Greek gods, who are also not completely omniscient, are certainly not omniscient or omnipotent, but don't really have that same, those same constraints on them. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I think. That may bring me to the end of my inspiration for the night. <laughs> Even with all this mead we've been drinking, I think my creativity may run dry. <laughs> all right, then why don't we call it a night? Indeed. And end with our story of creation there. <laughs> so again, this was all inspired by Create ICG and our involvement in the community of the Internet Creators Guild and our desire to build that community by getting a chance to see what the various people who are members are producing and how they think of creativity. So if you've enjoyed this podcast and might want to check some of the other stuff out, you can go to createicg.wordpress.com or you can check the show notes for this episode at alliterative.net slash podcast. You can look on Twitter or Facebook for hashtag createicg. Any of those things will find you videos and blog posts and podcasts and artwork on many, many, many different interpretations of the word create. And of course, we'll have a playlist of the videos. Yes. Yes. That'll be posted on the website and it's also at the end of our create video. Yeah. So you can just go straight to that if you want. And we'll also link to that in the show notes. And you could just watch all of the videos that have been produced for this week. Indeed. And if you think you might be interested in the ICG, if you're a creator, take a look. It does have a membership fee, but it's not terribly expensive. And we really enjoyed being part of it. Definitely worthwhile. All right. Until next time. Good night. Good night. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.